Good evening and a warm welcome once again as a family to meditate on who's who in the Bible. As scripture says, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we are gathered together once again as a family to pray with the Bible, to grow in the word and to continue to journey in the living word as we journey into the Father's house. So today we are going to meditate on a very important personality. Her name is Leah. Before we enter into the person of Leah, I want to get two premise clear so that it will not hinder us in our reflection. The first premise. The premise is of St. Augustine. Whenever we read the Bible, whenever we med meditate on the scriptures, whenever we reflect on the scriptures, we need to understand that scripture or the Bible does not reveal to us how the heavens or the earth was made, but rather how we can get to heaven. So the scripture is not a teaching on geography or history, but it is helping us to journey to the Father's house. The second important premise for us to know is the worldview of that time. Sometimes there can be this temptation to impose our current morality onto the morality at that particular time. For instance, today about Jacob having two wives and stuff like that. So we may wonder, does Bible promote polygamous relationship? No, no, we cannot come to conclusions like that. We cannot impose our morality onto them. Rather, the second important premise is we have to discover a God who is patiently journeying with the people of Israel. He's journeying patiently to teach them and to reveal to them. So the Bible is a gradual revelation to understand and to know the person of the Father. And so let's get these things clear so that we may not enter into confusion or doubts and it may hinder us in our reflection. So without delay, we enter into this time of reflecting on the person of Leah. Who is Leah in the Bible? What does her name mean? The Semitic meaning of her name is, it means a wild cow or impatient. But in the scriptures, especially in Genesis chapter 29, she is named as a tender-eyed woman. So a wild cow or an impatient woman, but more a tender-eyed person. What is her character that comes across to us? Leah is capable of both strong and enduring love, both strong and enduring love. She was a faithful mother and wife. She was manipulated by her father. She became jealous of her sister with whom it seems she never kind of reconciled. So the struggle, the human struggle of her character. Her sorrow, that she lacked her sister's beauty and that her love for her husband was one-sided. That is a little about her sorrow. Her joy, that she bore Jacob six sons and a daughter. She bore her husband, Jacob, six sons and a daughter. The key scriptures, where do we find the character or the person of Leah? Genesis chapter 29 to 35. In 29 to 30, we find her more actively present, but she's interspersed 
So from Genesis chapter 29 to verse 35, we find the person of Leah coming in and out in different moments. And the final mention of the person of Leah is in the book of Ruth chapter 4 verses 11. The book of Ruth chapter 4 verses 11 where the elders are blessing Boaz and Ruth with the blessings of Leah and Rachel. So that's where the final mention. So this is for us just to a brief overview of the personality, her character, her sorrow, her joy, and where in the scripture it's mentioned. So before we journey, I would request you to open your Bibles. Open your Bibles to, to the book of Genesis chapter 29. And before we uh, delve into the person of Leah, we'll just take a moment and pray to the Holy Spirit. Let us pray that God will help us to know and to understand the person of Leah and how she is relevant for us in our everyday life. O Holy Spirit of God, come into our hearts. Move us by your grace. Open our hearts and minds to know, to understand, and to heal us of all our wounds. Pour out your blessings and your graces that as we pray together as a family, we may remain in you, abide in you, and grow in you. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we go directly now into the person of Leah. Leah's story or mention begins in a tragedy. Why do I say that? In Genesis 29, the mention of Leah comes like a person caught in a crossfire. Her father, Laban, is planning to trick Jacob into serving him for seven extra years. Jacob is madly in love with Rachel. And Laban is going to manipulate himself to push Leah into Jacob. So on one hand, she is a victim of manipulation by the trickster Laban, her father. And on the other, being imposed on a man who does not love her. This is a very sad beginning for the person of Leah. And therefore, alongside Leah, we also bring the contradictory broken situations of our life and place it before God as we meditate. So we understand the person of Leah who begins, or rather scripture begins to describe her in a very, very difficult situation. And so, what's the person of Leah? The struggle that she had to go through. After Jacob celebrated his marriage with Leah for a week, he took Rachel as his wife. And in verse 30, Genesis 29 verse 30, there is a very important dynamic in this marriage. It said that then Jacob also went into Rachel and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He loved Rachel more than Leah. The beginning of her life of marriage is torn, is plunged into misery. Just imagine the psychological pain of Leah. She's a young girl who has so much of dreams and hopes that her marriage is going to bear fruit, that she's going to be a wonderful mother, a wonderful wife. She's looking at a life ahead and everything kind of comes crumbling down, crashing right in front of her eyes, even before it is beginning. There we have Leah going through her first trauma. 
On one hand, Laban thought that he is making, he has succeeded in making a good bargain in deals. But have you ever thought when we are meditating or praying Genesis chapter 29, what impact did it have on the person of Leah or Leah? What she must have actually gone through. She was now the wife of Jacob, a man who had not desired he did not desire her, nor expected to be his wife, as he had been in love with her younger sister, Rachel, all along. Imagine how it must have felt for Leah to have her husband for one week and then have him snatched away by her younger sister. Leah knew she was the unloved wife. Sometimes in our homes, we go through these moments of being unloved. How many women suffer from being unloved? How many are victims or of unhappy marriages through no fault of their own? Let us bring these situations before the Lord along with the person of Leah. But thankfully, thankfully, that's the crux of the story. That's the crux of this life. Thankfully, the story does not end like that. That is the beauty of our God. A God who never gives up on us. A God who is always watching over us. A God who always journey with, journeys with us. And a God who is closely journeying with Leah. In spite of being manipulated or rejected the rejection that she's facing, but God is now going to slowly transform that rejection into acceptance of being cast aside into being drawn into his heart. So God being aware of this unfortunate situation, what does scripture say in verse 31? God had compassion on Leah. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Genesis 29 verse 31. That means very clearly Leah was not overlooked or unloved by God. Rejected by man but accepted by God. God rewarded her with children which was highly important honor for a wife in those days, in those Semitic times. The names that Leah subsequently chose for her sons demonstrated that she had faith, trust, and hope in God. So we just go through the personality of Leah through the names that she gives to her various sons. So Leah conceived. Okay, this is Genesis 29, 32. So Leah conceived and bore a son and called the first son. His name was Reuben. What is the meaning of that? See a son. For she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. See the meaning of that. See a son. But did, did the, her husband love her? No. But God does not give up. Does, God does not leave her in the lurch. God do, looks upon her affliction and the suffering of Leah who is having tremendous faith in him. Leah hoped that her husband would now love her, but she, for she had borne him, her firstborn son. But still Jacob was continuing to ignore Leah. So God blessed Leah again. She conceived and bore a son. And now the second son, she names him Simeon, meaning heard. That means Leah had the faith that God heard her plight. So God sees, see a son, God sees, now God heard, okay, God is hearing. So Leah had the faith that God heard her plight of being unloved and had given her a son as well. Leah was still the only mother of Jacob's children, mind you. Still now, Rachel is barren. Verse 34, Leah conceived again and bore a son. Now this third son, she names him Levi, which means attached. Again, that hope, that 
Leah has. Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Leah was hoping that by now having three sons, Jacob would be even more attached to her. Leah also knew that God was helping her. Things didn't improve much for her. What happens again? God continues to journey with her. And she conceived again and bore a son. And now she names her son Judah, which means I will praise the Lord. Leah was so joyful to God for this fourth son that she praises God and she names him praise. And what is the teaching in and through these instances? It is that we are called to praise God in all circumstances of our life. Leah is going from one misery into another, through one difficulty into another, and Leah continues to hope, Leah continues to praise, Leah continues to trust in God, and that is what we are called to do, never to give up, never to give in to despair, never to give in to hopelessness, but continue to walk the walk with God, just like Leah did. And now, later, we will realize that it will be through Judah that the line of David will come. And David, the king after God's own heart, will give praise to God through his very life. And later, years later, thousands of years later, will come from the same line, the Messiah, for whom all creation will praise. What does all of this mean? teach us. It teaches us that God is always with us. God will never leave us and God will never, never abandon us. Abandon us. Then Leah bore a fifth son. His name was Issachar. And what does it mean? Wages. What is interesting to note is that prior to her conception of Issachar, she had prayed to God and God heard her prayers. It's almost as though God had given her the wages for all the labor that she has gone through. Genesis chapter 30, verses 17 to 18. And finally, Leah also conceived again and bore a sixth son, and his name was Zebulun, which means dwelling. A woman who was not loved, a woman who was manipulated, a wo woman who went through rejection right from her wedding day, right up to the very end, right till now. Out of the 12 tribes of Israel, six tribes will come out of Leah. Six strong tribes, which means a very important lesson for us to learn that the stone that is rejected by the builders, God transforms that stone to become his cornerstone. And therefore she prays, God has endowed, endowed me with good endowment and now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. What is the word for endowment? What does it imply in this passage? It means a gift or a dowry. So Leah knew that God had bestowed on her a substantial gift or dowry by, in giving her six sons. Then Leah also bore a daughter and her name was Dina. So all of this is the rejection of man, acceptance of God, sidelined by man, drawn into the heart by God. And so this is the constant struggle, not just of Leah, but for you and for me. But does the story of Leah end here? No, it doesn't end actually. In spite of having so many children, Leah had to go through a lot of tragedy. What were some of the tragedies, primary tragedies, even through her children, that Leah had to go through? The first, Dina, her only daughter, had been raped by a local prince on their return to Jacob's homeland. Leah hardly knew how to comfort her. She was shocked, pained. To make matters worse, her sons Levi and Simeon avenged their sister's, sister's 
tragedy by savagely murdering a whole town full of people. And then Reuben, her son, the eldest one, disgraced himself by sleeping with his father's concubine, Billa. The untold tragedies of a mother. Today, when we look at families, even today, children often cause a mother untold sorrow. Even tears are not enough to express the pain. It is a pain beyond expression. And it is into this person of Leah, because Leah, in spite of her personally going through all her pain and struggle, in spite of the blessings that God has given her, it doesn't end there. The journey of her misery continues. And then it enters into the next level. Leah must have wondered. Finally, at this time, when, when Jacob and Esau are going to meet a friendly encounter, supposed to be a friendly encounter, but Jacob is not sure. Esau has invited Jacob for a meeting. And so what does, ja uh, he, what does he do? He places all the people, the flocks and the, the, the goods that he has, the, the, the people who, the servants who work with him in the front line. But Leah's joy at the brother's friendly reunion was eclipsed by her sorrow once again because she is, she is again sidelined. She is, she is kept ahead of Rachel and her two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Which means Joseph and Benjamin and Rachel are the last. In case if Esau turns violent, it is easier for Rachel to run away and escape. Even there, she experiences comparison, partiality and being cast aside. These are realities, not just in the life of Leah and Jacob, even in families. Someone is loved more. Someone is sidelined. Someone is given a greater preference. Someone else is pushed, pushed aside. There is a lot of rejection and hurt that we go through. And we bring that all as we pray with the Bible today. That Leah's struggle is our struggle because God continues to journey with us. And again, as I said, the story does not end there. The story continues. But Jacob's love could not prevent Rachel from dying in childbirth. And let us remember that. Leah, not Rachel, was destined to be his first and his last wife. Alongside her husband, the father of Israel, she would be revered as the mother of Israel. In fact, the promise of a savior was not carried on through Rachel's Joseph or through Benjamin, but through Leah's Judah, whose descendants would include David. And finally, in the end, when Jacob was laid to rest in the cave of Machpelah, next to his first wife, Leah. He was laid to rest next to his wife, Leah, rather than his favorite wife, Rachel, who was buried somewhere near Ephrath. The Lord noticed Leah's misery. He looked down and saw a woman who was lonely and sad and broken because her husband loved the other wife better than he loved her. But God continued to bless her, blessed her with beautiful, intelligent, strong children. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Leah is our God. He sees our misery. No matter how small or large, he knows our circumstances, our feelings, our hurts. And just as in Leah's life, he's willing to step in and create something beautiful in and through us. Let's take a moment, my dear friends, in the practical part. We've just meditated on a whole lot of things, on a life of a very important person, 
very powerful personality, silent yet powerful, named Leah. Let's take a moment and surrender to God our rejection and our hurts. As a family, we may go through these moments of being unloved. Some of us experience rejection right from the mother's womb. Sometimes we, the parents are expecting a son, a male child and a daughter is born and therefore the rejection goes through the feelings of the mother and the father into the womb, into the child. Maybe they were expecting a girl and a boy is born, the rejection is passed on. And when the child is born, one is lighter skinned, one is darker skinned. There is comparisons. One is more intelligent, one is not so intelligent. There are comparisons, sidelining, preferences, comparisons. Maybe we are all victims like Leah in one form or the other. Let us bring them all before Jesus. We bring before Jesus, we bring before the Lord, the Father, the Son and the Spirit in and through the word of the prophet Isaiah chapter 53. We surrender our brokenness to the word. What does Isaiah 53 say? For he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was laid the chastisement that made us whole and by his stripes we are healed. Let us surrender all our stripes, our wounds to this God who is waiting for us with his arms open wide. And as the Bible says that God saw the misery of Leah. God heard the cry of Leah. God came down into the life of Leah. God walked with Leah. Will not that God walk with us? And if God is for us, who can be against us? For nothing can separate us from his love, neither life, nor death, nor nakedness, nor persecution, nor the sword, nothing in all of heaven or earth, for we are conquerors in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Good night, and God bless you. Thank you.